This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Iris Tao and for Tiffany Meyer. A second state's removing former President Trump's name from the primary ballot, Maine. But deep blue California makes the opposite call. The discontinuity is ramping up the pressure on the Supreme Court to act. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the story. Maine Secretary of State is following in the footsteps of Colorado, interpreting the 14th Amendment in a way they say makes Trump ineligible to run for office, once again drawing backlash from Trump's own challengers. It's unconstitutional, it's anti-American, it's wrong. This should be decided by the voters of the United States. It should not be decided by courts. Secretary of State Shanna Bellows acknowledges that no one in her position has ever used their authority in this way, but she says that no presidential candidate has ever engaged in insurrection before, even as Trump has not been found guilty or even been indicted on a charge of insurrection. The charges against Trump in the January 6th related case are a mix of obstruction and conspiracy charges. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about our constitutional rights and the ability of the American people to elect into leadership, the people that they choose. Trump's attorneys argue that Bellows has a personal bias because she's referred to January 6th as an insurrection and they've asked her to recuse herself. Trump's team will challenge her decision in court. Should the U.S. Supreme Court rule that Mr. Trump be on the ballot, I will in fact place him on the ballot. It's part of why I suspended the effect of my decision until the courts can act. Uh, so no ballots are being printed. Bellow's decision puts more pressure on the Supreme Court to act, especially as there's disagreements among the states over how to handle the issue. Other states saying not so fast. California being the latest to reject efforts to disqualify Trump. Late last night, the state's election chief, a Democrat, put out a list of certified candidates with Trump's name on it. Likewise, Michigan's Supreme Court this week rejected an effort to try to disqualify Trump. There have been several other states who have rejected such efforts, but there are also pending cases in a handful of other states. Now one Republican Senator, Tom Tillis of North Carolina, plans to take this fight to the halls of Congress. He plans to introduce a bill to restrict federal funds from going to states that try to block candidates from the ballot. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Israeli troops have uncovered an extensive underground tunnel network used by senior Hamas officials. An IDF officer on the front line in Gaza explains that it was equipped with underground restrooms and even an elevator. NDD's Jason Perry has the latest on the war and a warning. This report contains footage that some viewers may find disturbing. Hamas terrorists released another video on Friday as they try to maintain control of the Gaza Strip. Terrorists sneak through a destroyed building before spotting an apparent Israeli tank and firing an explosive at it. Although Hamas remains in full-scale war with Israel in the Gaza Strip, a Hamas leader at an unknown location on Friday said they're willing to consider any proposal to end the war. Egypt on Thursday said they had put forth a ceasefire deal and they're still waiting for a response. Israel, on the other hand, only wants a temporary ceasefire to release hostages and afterwards plans to continue their mission to defeat Hamas. And the IDF is continually gaining ground on the terrorist group, as seen by this Israeli commanding officer in the northern Gaza Strip. We have found a very significant tunnel network of Hamas, a network used by the senior officials. This tunnel network is different. It has an elevator that goes down a very long tunnel shaft, going through a place with rooms, bathrooms, air conditioners, and the ability to conduct operations. IDF soldiers lined the tunnels with explosives, and after they got out, Israel's defense minister on Friday said the IDF is now focused on Gaza's second largest city, Khan Yunus, in the southern Gaza Strip. But discerning the terrorists from civilians can be difficult, as seen in this children's bedroom in Khan Yunus, a pink child's backpack filled with grenades and ammunition. Also on Friday, the Israeli government spokesperson said the IDF mistakenly fired the wrong munition in a previous airstrike, which resulted in the death of many innocent civilians. 
He said Israel regrets any loss of life because they're trying to do everything they can to minimize civilian casualties, while Hamas has a strategy of maximizing casualties. Meanwhile, on Thursday, after an Israeli strike in Rafah in southern Gaza, rescuers were able to pull this baby out from under the rubble, and this man ran with her to the hospital. She reportedly survived without any severe injuries. However, the baby's mother and sister were killed in the blast, and her father and brother survived. Other Palestinians displaced from the war, now living in tents in Deir al-Bala in central Gaza, shared their experiences. For a month we are here. We are suffering. No clean bathrooms, no food. It was really hard to find wheat. We suffer from everything, also water. We suffer from all sides. I buried my children, a child 16 years old, another one aged 18, something I really can't believe. Also, my nephew, he was two years old. I buried him. I buried my wife. I never thought in my life that I will bury my children. I thought they will bury me. Meanwhile, across Israel's northern border, Lebanese officials recently met with officials from France and the UK about the escalating war between Israel and Hezbollah. And an IDF spokesperson said on Thursday that if the diplomatic community cannot take care of the situation with Hezbollah, Israel will use whatever weapons and means they have at their disposal to take them out. Jason Perry, NTD News. Turning our attention now to the Russia-Ukraine war, dozens were killed today when over 100 Russian missiles rained down on Ukraine. Ukraine says this was Russia's biggest airstrike so far in the war. Ukrainian officials said Russia launched 122 missiles and 36 drones against cities across Ukraine on Friday. At least 30 people were killed and over 160 were injured. Ukraine considers this the biggest aerial barrage of the war. The attacks hit Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. I was woken up at half past 7 a.m. by a horrible sound. It was so frightening. The missile was flying and everything was buzzing, whirring. I didn't know what to do. Other cities hit include Odessa along the Black Sea coast, Dnipro, Zaporizhia and Kharkiv in the interior, and Lviv, a major city in the western part of Ukraine. The attacks caused widespread damage to local infrastructure. One person died, eight sought medical help, one injured is in quite a severe condition. There is a lot of damage. Residential buildings are here. Ten residential buildings, practically all of them are damaged. Russia's defense ministry on Friday said that in the past seven days, the military launched 50 group strikes and one massive strike with missiles and drones against Ukraine. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Meanwhile, Poland says a suspected Russian missile enters airspace today from the direction of Ukraine before vanishing off radars. And Poland is a NATO member state. It didn't take any actions against the missile, but is now investigating the incident. And now Chinese citizens at the U.S. southern border. In November, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection saw more encounters with Chinese migrants than ever before. This comes as a new report says that the FBI can't keep up with DNA testing for illegal immigrants. NDD's Arian Pastor has a border update. New numbers show that Agents for Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, encountered almost 5,000 Chinese nationals at the southern border in November. In November of last year, the number was 10 times lower at around 500 encounters. Back in June, Homeland Security Committee Chairman Mark Green told the Daily Wire that those immigrants have ties to the Chinese People's Liberation Army, or PLA. Verification that the individuals being released into the United States come from or have ties to the PLA it came from a sector chief. And in terms of overall encounters, November is in second place. The month saw about a quarter million people. Only September of this year saw more encounters at the southern border. Also, the FBI reportedly has a huge backlog of testing immigrants' DNA. That's according to the Daily Caller, which released internal communication from Homeland Security on Friday, appearing to show that the FBI doesn't have enough money to run the program, which is a statutory requirement. They are looking at a 15-month backlog. DNA testing is used partly to see if immigrants are wanted for any crimes. 
And lastly, the Department of Justice might sue Texas. That's over a new state law which would give local judges the authority to deport illegal immigrants. Governor Greg Abbott responded to the possible lawsuit, writing, The Biden administration not only refuses to enforce current U.S. immigration laws, they now want to stop Texas from enforcing laws against illegal immigration. I've never seen such hostility to the rule of law in America. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. What's the Maine Secretary of State arguing? What will happen from here? Joining us now to unpack Maine's decision to remove Trump from the ballot, we have Mark Miller, Senior Attorney at Pacific Legal. Mark Miller, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to join you, Iris. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. And first, there are a lot of controversies surrounding the Maine decision, among them that the person who made this decision is a Democratic state election official, not even a court, like in the Colorado case. So explain for us how the Maine state secretary was able to make that decision and whether it holds legal weight under the Constitution. Yeah, so the Maine secretary of state is a Democratic uh, secretary of state. And she uh, took this position because statute does allow her and, and requires her to decide who should be on the ballot, usually to see whether they're qualified. Uh, but this is the first time where a secretary of state in this position is deciding to rule that the candidate is not qualified, President Trump, because he was an insurrectionist. So that's new. And that definitely will get challenged in court, as President Trump's lawyers have said. And now going back to the fundamental legal debate here about the 14th Amendment, the argument that Trump participated in an insurrection, as the main Secretary of State alleges, despite the lack of a criminal conviction, does that argument hold up under judicial scrutiny? Well, that's the $64,000 question, Iris. And certainly there has been no conviction. There's nothing in the Constitution or the 14th Amendment that says there has to be a conviction. But on the other hand, it does seem uh, peculiar that uh, a, a Colorado Supreme Court, four justices out of seven, or that a secretary of state, who's not even, as you said, a lawyer, let alone a judge, is deciding that they think the Constitution applies, the 14th Amendment applies, and that they can unilaterally bounce President Trump from the ballot. And of course, Jay Sekulow, on behalf of the Colorado Republican Party, has appealed this to the US Supreme Court, that Colorado decision. Uh, the main decision will be probably hot on the heels of that case. And I think ultimately it will be the U.S. Supreme Court that has to resolve this. And as you mentioned, Trump's team is already vowing to appeal and both the main and the Colorado decisions are currently on hold until legal challenges make their way through the courts. So dive into the specific legal timeline, timeline here. What's coming next and how fast can we expect things to unfold? Well, it is moving very quickly. Uh, as I said, Jay Sekulow and his group, the American Center for Law and Justice, has already taken a challenge to the Colorado case. And the lawyers for that are attacking the uh, validity of Trump's candidacy in Colorado already responded. They asked the Supreme Court to expedite the case, or actually agreed with Sekulow and said, yes, this case should be expedited. I just checked the docket. The Supreme Court of the United States has not said it would expedite the case. And in, in fact, last week, when Jack Smith, in one of the criminal cases against President Trump, asked for the Supreme Court to expedite it, the Supreme Court said no. Uh, this case, though, will be probably be different. Uh, it certainly is different. It's not a criminal case. But at the same time, whether President Trump is on the ballot is an immediate issue. And you can see the U.S. Supreme Court deciding to take this very quickly. And in fact, there are dates in their January calendar available for oral argument should they move that quickly. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is already saying that the main decision, quote, opens up Pandora's box. How do you expect similar cases to play out in other states where cases are pending? And are we going to see a Republican Secretary of State also trying to disqualify President Biden from the ballot, you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. Whoever goes first tends to set the precedent. And so when Colorado's Supreme Court decided four to three that they would say Trump can't be on the ballot, that set in motion this main decision. Of course, the California Secretary of State uh, said, or maybe it was Lieutenant Governor said, that he that he might be bounced there. Of course, they decided against it. California is going to keep him on the ballot for now for the primaries. But once Colorado went jumped first, you can expect other states to follow. Some Republican states have said they may follow. Others have said they would not. Christy Nome, for example, in South Dakota, the governor, she said no. Her responsibility is to follow the law. And the fact that the Colorado Supreme Court did something wrong doesn't mean that she should also do something wrong. And that's to her credit. So I think that you may see other states uh, 
uh, find that uh, President Trump can be on the ballot, but that's only going to be until the U.S. Supreme Court intervenes. The U.S. Supreme Court will have the final word on this. And lastly, before I let you go here, I think the one question that a lot of voters are, you know, thinking about is whether any of this is going to have any ultimate fundamental impact on the general election come November. Well, certainly putting my political prognostication hat on, if the Supreme Court were to rule and, and surprise many and say that Trump can be removed from the ballot or, or he has to be as an insurrectionist, obviously that would impact the outcome. Um, if they go the other way, what I think more people predict, um, I think that what these decisions are doing is making President Trump more popular with those who, who don't really look at him as a candidate so much as they look at him as a symbol, that he's being attacked and they think unfairly. And so there's many voters who are voting him for that reason, not for his policies. It's a very strange sort of turn of events that we've seen over the last year, and it only promises to get stranger in 2024. Well, lots to watch for in the coming weeks and months. Mark Miller, thanks so much for the great insight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Iris. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. So, Dave, a lot to unpack right here. Let's start with some sports and politics. Ohio governor, who's a Republican, vetoed a bill that would have prevented doctors from prescribing and performing transgender procedures for minors. The bill would have also prevented transgenders from competing in women's sports. Now, he's a Republican. Why would he do this? And what's the argument here between the two sides? You know, this seems to be a fairness versus compassion kind of debate that's gotten very contentious, of course. You know, I always hear from one side that these rules exclude transgender athletes from playing sports, but I found that to be somewhat misleading. You know, they usually just force sports teams to be separated by their gender at birth or whatever XX versus XY chromosomes, like they've always been. But everyone, of course, is either one or the other, so I really don't see how anyone is excluded. Now, clearly, there are physical differences between men and women. Men have larger lung capacity, stronger bone density, and, of course, higher testosterone levels, which builds muscle. Now, if you think about it, why are steroids banned in every major sport? It's because it increases testosterone, which, of course, is a huge competitive advantage. I think that's why you never hear a problem with this the other way. There are actually scholarships on the line. Now, getting back to the vetoed bill, it can be overridden with a three-fifths majority vote, so it's not dead at this point. And Dave, you have talked with a number of female athletes yourself who have, of course, told you that you know, it's not fair to compete against men in sports. What about the fact that they might have to change in the same locker room? This is actually the bigger issue. You know, Former NCAA swimmer Riley Gaines was in tears talking about her experience with this on Capitol Hill. You know, it's hard to believe there are so many lawmakers that are for this, you know, given that it could affect someone close to them. There have been plenty of sexual misconduct incidents in bathrooms and locker rooms as a result of this. You know, when I interview these girls, there's always two questions I want to know. What percent of their female peers support males competing against them? And what percent are fine with changing in the same locker room with them? They all say the vast majority of girls are not for competing against men. None of them know anyone who's fine with changing in the same locker room with them. I think these politicians would do well to talk to these girls before deciding these things. And now shifting gears to talk about golf here. We know the year end deadline for the proposed merger between PGA and Liv is fast approaching. We're just a few days left in the year. Is there any word of extending that proposal or otherwise it's going to just fall apart? Well, according to a report in the Telegraph, the deadline is going to be extended. Now, no specific date was given, except that the hope is that it's going to be done before the Masters, which is in April. Now, I'll say this merger seemed to be you know, a life support just a few weeks ago when Liv poached another one of the PGA's players, John Rahm. Now, there are also reports that the PGA was entertaining U.S. investors as well, so it's gone both ways. The, the two seem to be back to being rivals instead of working together to create a deal. Now, it certainly seems like each side needs what the other has. The PGA has a very marketable brand, while Liv, or really the Saudi Arabia public investment fund that owns it, has you know, vastly, vast wealth, a lot of money. Now, it doesn't mean they can make a deal, so we'll have to see where this actually goes. Well, that's a while for sure. For sure, then. Thank you so much, Dave, for your insights, as always. Thanks, Cyrus. With the year 2023 almost over, we take a look at some of the major events that happened near the end of this year. From the start of the Israel-Hamas war to the Colorado ruling trying to block former President Trump from the state's primary ballot. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has the final segment of our multi-part series. 
Hamas launches a terrorist attack on Israel October 7th, firing thousands of rockets from Gaza and breaching the border to murder civilians in towns. The terrorists killed around 260 people at an Israeli music festival that morning and kidnapped others back to Gaza to parade through the streets. Israel says Hamas terrorists killed roughly 1,200 people and took over 240 hostages. The Israeli government officially declared war on Hamas October 8th and began targeting terrorist commanders and infrastructure with airstrikes in response. Evacuations were issued along Israel's northern border with Lebanon as clashes with Iran-backed terrorist group Hezbollah increased. An explosion at a hospital in Gaza City triggers outrage mid-October after widespread reports of an Israeli airstrike. The U.S. and Israel after an investigation determined it was caused by a misfired rocket by the terrorist group Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I was deeply saddened and outraged by the uh, explosion at the hospital in Gaza yesterday. And based on what I've seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not, not you. Hamas releases the first hostages October 20th to American citizens. Aid trucks begin entering Gaza through the Rafah border crossing from Egypt. And the United Nations Secretary General begins accusing Israel of violating international humanitarian law in the Gaza Strip. At the end of October, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announces ground operations in Gaza have begun, vowing to destroy the enemy above and below ground. Now, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is ousted. Representative Mike Johnson wins the gavel as the fourth GOP nominee. Netanyahu November 7th states Israel's military had encircled Gaza City and is operating inside. MRI center. The military begins operating near Gaza's largest hospital, Al Shifa, and finds weapons and terrorist infrastructure during a raid. A closet here, which is in the main part of the clinic, this is what they found. A live grenade, ammunition, fighting vest. November 24th, Qatar's foreign ministry announces Israel and Hamas have agreed to a four-day pause, subject to extension, to facilitate the release of hostages. The pause lasts seven days. Hamas releases around 100 hostages in exchange for roughly 210 Palestinian prisoners held on terrorism-related charges. The pause ends when Hamas violates terms of the deal by firing rockets at Israel and failing to release at least 10 hostages a day. At the APEC summit in San Francisco, President Biden doubles down on his view that Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping is effectively a dictator. And in Argentina, libertarian Javier Malay is elected president and 40 construction workers are rescued from a collapsed tunnel in India's Himalayas after being trapped for 17 days. Israel resumes combat operations against Hamas targets in Gaza December 1st. The U.S. vetoes a proposed United Nations Security Council demand for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, saying it would only benefit Hamas. Israeli troops accidentally shoot and kill three hostages, a tragedy that the IDF says violates its own rules of engagement as they were holding a white flag. The incident is under investigation. The IDF also uncovers a massive Hamas tunnel big enough to drive cars through a quarter mile from the Erez crossing at the Israeli border. Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry claims over 20,000 civilians have been killed. The numbers are unverified and do not differentiate combatants. Back in the U.S., the Colorado Supreme Court rules former President Trump ineligible to appear on the state's primary ballot. Four of seven justices deemed that Trump had participated in an insurrection and should be disqualified under a rarely used clause of the 14th Amendment in the U.S. Constitution. The Colorado court placed the ruling on hold until January 4th, pending Trump's appeal. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. 2023 was an eventful year for the housing and job markets. Earlier today, I spoke with NTD business host Don Ma for a recap of the big moments in real estate and labor sectors. Don, thanks so much for being here. Great to be with you, Iris. So as we are closing out 2023 here, tell us some of the biggest moments when it comes to the real estate sector. Well, Iris, uh, the biggest thing I think this year for the real estate market is that we actually did not see a commercial real estate crash. Uh, I mean, if you remember, uh, there were so many predictions about that this year. Uh, you had headlines like uh, the party's over in commercial real estate and many more in that vein. Um, U.S. office vacancy rates hovered around 28 percent in 2023. Uh, but then, you know, employees slowly started heading back to their desks and more companies, including BlackRock, Amazon, Salesforce, uh, they started ordering uh, workers to return to offices at least three times uh, a week. Uh, so that helped a little bit. Uh, but, you know, other than commercial real estate, the housing market uh, went through a lot as well. This was a year that the housing market essentially froze over and 
dominant uh, story for the year was mortgage rates. And the U.S. housing market in 2023 kicked off uh, with rates at around the mid-6% range. Uh, then by mid-October, they topped 8%. And then the higher they went, right, the more potential buyers were priced out. And then uh, at the same time, potential sellers uh, would be deciding to stay put and hold on to their low, low mortgage rates. So a lot of activity, activity was uh, put on hold because of high uh, mortgage rates. And as well, home prices refused to come down this year. The median home price went up uh, 2% uh, year over year. This is according to Realtor.com. And this is, by the way, it's a new record here. Prices started at, at around $403,000 in January. Steadily rose in the first half of the year, and they peaked at $445,000 in June. So just a brief overview of the market here. Well, definitely all eyes are on the Fed as it decides whether or not to raise rates again when it comes to, you know, of course, including mortgage rates. And now talking about the job market, when those a big thing, a big touting point for the Biden administration touting about job numbers. And tell us what's significant about the job market in 2023. Yeah, you're right about that. But the U.S. job market, it seems like to me, didn't have as an eventful of a year when compared to the real estate market, uh, which I think it's good news, actually, because we didn't have a very turbulent job sector. Unemployment rates uh, remained low according to uh, compared to historical standards. Uh, you know, despite, as you mentioned earlier, the Federal Reserve's rate hiking campaign, uh, we saw, you know, solid job growth uh, month to month for the whole year. In fact, uh, the market started off pretty hot and then started to cool a little bit and started to normalize uh, later in the year. And I think one of the top points of discussion this year was actually how tight uh, the job market was. Uh, you know, at one point, there were around two job positions uh, open for every one single person looking for a job. So, you know, a lot of employers faced challenges in hiring this year, this year amid a, a labor shortage. Um, and in 2023, of course, we saw a lot of big companies doing layoffs, especially in the tech sector, right? This includes uh, major players like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Twitter, Meta, Spotify, the list goes on. The tech industry has seen more than uh, 240,000 jobs uh, lost in 2023. And let me just uh, mention one more point. Uh, another big point of discussion this year was actually remote work. Uh, if you remember, remote work spiked during the pandemic, and it seems like it hasn't gone away just yet, at least for this year. But many big company CEOs uh, actually uh, had some thoughts to say on this topic. For example, CEO uh, of JP Morgan uh, called himself a remote work skeptic. Mark Zuckerberg says that engineers get more done in the office. Uh, same with Elon Musk. And ironically, even Zoom's leadership wanted employees back uh, in person two, two days a week. Uh, so, but, you know, looking at uh, 2023 state of remote work, it seems like it's uh, here to stay at least for this year. Well, definitely a lot of attention on the job market and on the economy overall as we enter 2024 presidential election year as voters care about the economy. Thanks so much, Don, as always, and looking forward to hearing more from you in the coming year. Thank you. And that's all for today's news. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Iris Tao. Tiffany will be back on Monday. Until then, wishing everyone a happy new year. Good night.